يعطيكم العافيه جميعا مساكم خير جود افترنون ايفري بادي هير ان عمان تايم And good morning to uh, everyone else uh, watching us from USC. Dr. Marwa, good morning for you. Thank you for having you in, on board in our conference. We are very glad to have you on board. Uh, Dr. Marwa will deliver uh, a presentation uh, today about HVAC strategies in the age of COVID-19. Uh, for uh, Dr. Marwa, uh, we would like to uh, say something about her. She's, uh, she's a PhD. Uh, in environmental engineering from the University of Texas, Austin. She has a master's degree as well in engineering management from the American University of Beirut. Uh, Dr. Manwa is uh, an, an actually distinguished lecturer, actually. She delivers uh, lots of lectures about uh, indoor air quality, to, uh, standard 62.1, uh, particulate filters, etc. She is the vice chair of the committee of 2.3, I guess 2.4 as well. Uh, she's very active. She's been doing uh, the business of uh, indoor air quality for Asher since I know her more than 10 years or maybe 12 years. And uh, we're very proud to have her on board. Uh, as I told you, she's one of the real distinguished lecturers, especially in the field of indoor air quality, because it's her specialty since quite a long time. Uh, she served in so many Asher committees, uh, and she uh, is in the committee that puts the standard 62.1 and also the standard 145.2 for the laboratory uh, testing methods. Dr. Marwa, uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, the mic is yours if you can introduce more about yourself and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you, Rami. And uh, thank you everyone for attending today and th thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, I'm also on the ASHRA Epidemic Task Force, and I'm involved uh, to put uh, the COVID-19 guidelines in commercial buildings, communities of faith, like churches, mosques, uh, and others, and also how to get the building ready to reopen safely. And uh, finally, we are now have a group uh, to issue some guidance about portable air cleaning and to evaluate the different uh, tools to estimate uh, risk. Uh, anyway, so my presentation today is about HVAC strategies in the age of uh, in the age of COVID. So from the beginning of this pandemic, um, we know that the HVAC system can play a very important role in the solution uh, and can help to mitigate the risk of transmission of COVID-19. But even myself, and I'm on the ASHRA Epidemic Task Force, it was very hard at the beginning to digest all the information. So we were bombarded by a lot of strategies and a lot of equipment. And you've probably heard this before, everyone is trying to sell something. But these strategies are about mainly, you know, ventilation with outdoor air, about filtration and, and some other, like basically to, to operation and maintenance. But here the challenge is that some of these strategies are contradictory. For example, at the beginning of this pandemic, we're told do 100% outside air. If all the air in your building is 100%, then it doesn't make any sense to upgrade your filters, specifically for COVID, because your filters are going to clean indoor air. And if you, don't, if you only have 100% outside air, then there's no indoor air that's being recirculated. And also there's some challenges that come with outdoor air, uh, for example, pollution, uh, relative humidity, and some spaces do not have capability by design to do outside air. Uh, and I have to say, since March till now, we've come a long way in terms of, of these strategies. Before I tell you uh, what Ashley came up with as core principles or core recommendations, I want to show you this graph. And I showed this graph 10 years ago, five years ago, and also today. In my work, I deal with a lot of clients to have a pandemic plan, how to reopen safely whether it's schools, universities, offices, whether it's gyms, theater, fighting arenas. And when you come to the, you know, the real life or the practical application for it, there's always a question. How can we know that we did enough? How can we know it's safe to reopen? How can we balance the risk and the cost, can be first cost, operating cost, and also if you're dealing, you have sustainability goals, how can we balance also sustainability goals and the impact on the environment? So this graph, I basically tailored it today to uh, be descriptive of this pandemic. If you look at number one, I have pandemic, usually I have poor indoor air quality. You've always heard that we spend most of our times indoors, 90% of our time indoor, and we typically deal with poor indoor air quality. 
Today, we're, we're dealing with something similar, which is a pandemic, so number one. And then when we are dealing with this problem, then we have strategies, so you go to number two. Most of these strategies will incur energy consumption. And for example, if you have more outside air, then you're paying more, you're producing more energy to cool and dehumidify the air. If you're putting uh, an air cleaner, you're putting, for example, fan energy, uh, etc. So we put energy. And what happens when you put energy, you contribute to more emissions, outdoor air pollutants, basically. And if you're bringing it to dilute indoor air pollution, then you are, you know, contributing more to the problem. So I call this the vicious cycle. And I believe that there is a better way to do it. There is a way to combat this pandemic while at the same time being energy efficient and while at the same time to decrease emissions, you know, outdoor air emissions and, you know, meet our sustainability goals. And if you do a quick search on Google, if you put COVID-19 and also you put uh, climate change, you have many of these headlines. And many of these headlines basically will say that, you know, there is a link between COVID-19 and climate change. At least we have three studies. And I know there's a speaker after me from Italy, but basically three studies, one in Italy was done in the Northern region, one from California and one from Harvard Public School of Health. And the three of them, they say that if you have high outdoor air pollution, it was linked to COVID-19 mortality. So there, there is a link between COVID-19 uh, and mortality and maybe COVID-19 and transmission between, uh, between outdoor air pollution. Now, when I write pandemic plans to our clients, this is the approach I, I follow. The first one is airborne transition, uh, airborne transmission. So we, we are dealing with airborne transmission and here, what I mean by airborne, I know there's a lot of debate about it, but can be long range transmission, basically through HVAC system, or can be short range transmission, basically, you know, uh, from person to person, but beyond the six feet or the two meter, uh, you know, distinction. The second one, it's a multi-layer defense strategy. Uh, it's very important. And if you follow me on, on social media, this is my whole spiel. There is no magic bullet. There's no one solution that can solve our problem or you know, the magic cure. It's a multi-layer defense strategy and you're always trying to make your space safer, not, not safe. And my other spiel is that we need to focus on the basics. So in all my plans, there is no fancy technologies to say it nicely. It's all focusing on the basics of basically ventilation, the basic of particulate filtration and maintaining your system. The third one, you have to have an understanding that if you're doing a plan, it has to be specific per your space type and also activity type and duration. You know, doing a classroom is very different than doing your home or basically a theater or, or something else. So it has to, it has to be by, by space type, activity and duration. And the last one, so you can stop here or you can go one more step and basically talk about the risk. So actually estimate the risk um, while considering different strategies, what is the energy impact, and also what is the carbon impact assessment. So you can have many strategies and then choose the strategies that will work you know, specifically for, for your project. And here is, it has all to do with basically performance-based approaches. Now, Ashley published 400 pages 400 pages of, of guides, of guidelines for COVID-19, distributed by different building types. We have many different organizations that also published COVID-19 recommendation. I wanna present for you here a very clear and a, a summary of all these recommendations. We're calling them the core recommendation. So if you start by these and you turn them into a checklist, you will be, you'll be, you have a very good start. The first one, is from Ashri, which is the minimum outside air. So uh, Dr. Amura before me, uh, she talked about the three procedures, the prescriptive approach, ventilation rate procedure, the indoor air quality procedure, which is a performance-based approach, and lastly, the natural ventilation procedure. So you have to have the minimum outside air. And I also heard that schools, and I'm familiar with that, in our region, basically, they don't have ventilation. And I can show you an example how to deal with that. The second one is to have MERV 13. So this is the filtration efficiency. I will talk later in details about this. I also saw a question uh, about, uh, about filtration. But then they say, or equivalent. The equivalent here is key. For example, a lot of our clients, they have double stage filtration, like a MERV 7 and MERV 11, or MERV 7 and MERV 10. 
if you have double stage filtration, you don't need to upgrade each filter to MERV-13. You might get away with it if you can prove that the combination of filter is equivalent to MERV-13. And last, we have basically air cleaning. It can be portable air cleaning. It can be you know, ceiling mounted. It can be wall mounted. There is a lot of these air cleaning. But here I'm talking specifically about the basic air cleaning, a fan and a filter, the basic filter. The third one is to, you know, it goes without saying, but maintain design temperature relative humidity. Uh, number four, flush out. I have a slide about flush out and flush out means you clean your space before people come in, either in the morning or, or at night. Or for example, if you have a community of faith, like a mosque, you, you basically, if you have two services, you wait and you clean between the two services, you clean the air. Same thing if you have a classroom or theater, et cetera. Uh, number five is to maintain your system, goes without saying. You can design the best building, if, but if you don't maintain it, uh, you're not doing a good job. Number six is target air exchange rate. And uh, I'm not sure where, I, I don't remember the name of the engineer that asked about this. So typically in ASHRAE standard 62.1 for commercial, educational, you know, retail, uh, gym buildings, we do it CFM per square foot plus CFM per person, as Dr. Shaza men mentioned. For this pandemic, Harvard and UC Boulder introduced one more metric, which is air exchange rate. Typically, we only have air exchange rate in hospitals, standard 170. What is air exchange rate? Air exchange rate, as the name indicates, is how many times you're changing the air in your building per hour. So if you have an air exchange rate of six, you're changing the air in your building six times. It's a very easy equation, especially when it comes to outside air. You take the outside air volume and you outside air volume, outside air flow volume, so meter cube per hour, and you divide by the volume of your space meter cube, and you obtain one per hour. Now, what happened is that for COVID-19, uh, Harvard Public School of Health and UC Boulder, Colorado, they came up with this, uh, I, I put here on speedometer, with this guideline of what the air exchange rate should be. Uh, and you can apply this into your office building, your home, or, or a classroom. And they say it should be minimum uh, at least five air exchange rate. So five air exchange rate and basically the description is excellent. So anything above five is excellent. So when you're trying to do a pandemic plan to reopen safely and you, you can basically go through these recommendations, number six, you can assign a specific air exchange rate which should be five. The key here is that the air exchange rate doesn't have only to do outside air. This is really important. And specific, specifically if you don't have outside air by design, it can be as well filtration, so from indoor air filters, and it can be as well portable air cleaning or, you know, in-room air cleaning. And, and for filters, it's, if you put filters, it's very easy to achieve a very, high, a very high air exchange rate. I will show you later an example. And we call this metric now effective air exchange rate. So it's a sum between any, um, any basically device that can give you air cleaning on one condition is that you need to know actually the efficiency and the airflow. So you can't just make up a number, you actually need to know it and apply it. So outside air filtration and in-room air cleaning. Now about filtration, and I basically wanna take a brief moment before I show you uh, basically the example, because I see this topic, uh, there's a lot of confusion about, about filtration and whether filtration actually works. And there's a lot of confusion from specifically electronic air cleaners. They try to sell, you know, different electronic air cleaners by saying that the actual basic filtration do not work. So from the beginning of this pandemic, we were told two pieces of really bad news. The first one is that the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual virus name, uh, is very small. How small? 0.12 micrometer. Um, and uh, I know uh, Engineer Salah said, you know, in, in, in where you live, you have many different uh, uh, air station, air quality station to monitor the air quality. I'm sure one of them is PM 2.5, another one is PM 10. So imagine this, all what we've been caring about is 2.5 micron or 10 micron. And now they tell us that the new virus is 0 0.1 micron. And just for, you know, um, uh, to put things into perspective, the average diameter of human hair, one human hair, which we can barely see, is 50 micron, five zero micron. So this virus is really small. The other piece of bad news, and there's still maybe a lot of debate about it, um, is the virus can be airborne. So it's very small, it can be everywhere. So everyone start to say, okay, we're doomed, you know, and it start to be like big headlines about this. However, we also know, and this is not very new, this is, you know, decades of research, 
is that the virus, the coronavirus family does not exist naked. So what does it mean does not exist naked? It means is that it, it basically has to latch to other particulate matter or other bodily fluid. Why I'm telling you this and why this is very good news, I'm showing you an example of research that basically say, when we cough, when we sneeze, when we talk, if we are at the gym, if we are sleeping, we produce not only one size, we produce a myriad size of particles. So this is a wide, wide range of the size of particles. And this is an example of particle size distribution. It basically say, the good news is 60% of the RNA of the virus is above one micron. And this basically explain why is this good news. So the, this graph shows uh, the one on top, efficiency on the y-axis. On the x-axis, it shows particulate size. So first, first notice is that it's uh, basically an inverse bell curve. So it's a bell curve. And you see basically the lowest efficiency is somewhere between 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 micron. What does this mean? Above 0 0.3 mark, micron, filters are very efficient. Below 0 0.1 micron, filters are very efficient. So when you hear that HEPA filters is certified at 0 0.3 micron, it doesn't mean they cannot remove below 0 0.3 micron. It means this is a point where they have the lowest efficiency. So again, above 0 0.3 micron, very efficient. Be below 0 0.1 micron, very efficient. So what we're talking about, the most uh, particle size of interest is between 0 0.3 micron to five micron. And what I told you before is, 60% of the virus RNA is above one micron. And if you follow with me a MERV 13 that we know we can put in our buildings, that's readily available, that we have the third party efficiency test, there is established ASHRAE test and also international tests like ISO for a long time, actually works and works very well. And you can follow with me here, MERV 13, orange, and you can follow the efficiency. Above one micron, the efficiency is above 85%. So this is where the good news lie. So imagine this, most of the air in your building is recirculated air, at least 80% of it. This 80% is going through a very, very efficient filter. If you hear this and you have some outside air and you're operating and maintaining your building, you don't need to do much more. And you don't need to say, oh, I can't open my building safely, or I need to buy these magic technologies that are not basically vetted correctly. Now, if you look at the efficiency table, just put, to put things into perspective, even if you have a MERV 7 today, you have 44% efficient. MERV 11, 72% efficient. MERV 13 is 87% efficient. And if you don't know what MERV is, MERV is a minimum efficiency reported value. It's a rating that gives you basically for each filter, it gives you a number uh, from four to 16. HEPA is not in this uh, same rating. Um, and give you basically an efficiency for different particulate size. And the nice thing is that this test is readily available. I'll show you later an example. So how to choose particulate filtration? There's also a lot of myth how to choose a particulate filter. Typically, you know, there's a first cost of the filter, the energy consumption, there's a pressure drop, and there's actual efficiency. The first good news, as I mentioned, I'm gonna re-mention again, is that it's very easy to ask your distributor or your manufacturer for this ASHRAE test that tell you the pressure drop and efficiency. So it's not a black box. It's something that we even have access to for a long time. We have in our building and actually works very well. But this, and, and the first myth is that if you have a high efficiency filter, then you will have a high pressure drop. And I hear this from all my clients. Oh, I cannot put a MERS 13 because it's gonna choke my, my system. This is not actually necessarily true. I show you here a database that I have. Now I have around 138 different filters. Each red dot is a unique filter. On the y-axis is a pressure drop. On the x-axis is basically different MERV category. So the high the MERV category, the high the efficiency. For the sake of the comparison, I made all of them at the same face velocity and all of them the same basically depth of the filter. So two take away from this slide. The first one is that like you can have a same MERV 13 and you can see here the basically the range of the different filters and it's a range. So you, the range of pressure drop. So if you basically have a MERV 13, you need to dig deeper in the test data to know what is the pressure drop because it, it can vary. So MERV is not equal MERV. This is myth number one. Myth number two is that it's not necessarily, and you look at between MERV 13 and MERV 8, 
it's not necessarily if you have a MERV-13 to increase the pressure drop on your system. This is extremely important. You can actually have a MERV-13 that have lower pressure drop than your current system. And I did this in my home and I do it to our clients. I ask them, okay, what do you have today? Let's look at the actual make and model of your filter. Let's get the data, which is again, readily available. Let's plot it and we put it here. And then we choose a MERV-13 that is equivalent to what they have today in terms of pressure drop. The other uh, thing I want to show you, again, each basically, each uh, dot here is a unique filter. MERV-13 is in green, MERV-11 is in red, and MERV-8 is in blue. You have efficiency on the y-axis, and on the x-axis you have pressure drop. So the first thing I want to tell you is that not all the MERV-13 will have the same efficiency. Similar, not all the MERV-11, not all the MERV-8. And here, if you want to like, have better performance, again, you take the data from the manufacturer and actually you take a look at it and you can have a specification specific to a particulate size. And in this way, you make sure that you're having, what you're paying for is you're paying for the highest efficiency and the lowest pressure drop. The other one, which is extremely important, and I don't think we also talk about it a lot, is the filter bypass. And by filter bypass, I mean, when you put your filter in the air handling unit, if you don't fit it very well, you will have air gaps from top, bottom, right, or, or left, or between the filters. Filter bypass is extremely uh, good to take care of. To give you an example, there is this basically scientific study that take a look at what is the impact of filter bypass on efficiency. And I put here a snapshot. I have the, uh, basically the, the study in a, in, a, in a link. Please take a look at it. But basically, if you have a MERV-15, you saw a MERV-15, and you have a 10 millimeter gap, so one centimeter gap, very, very small gap, a MERV-15 will act like a MERV-8. So imagine this, like you paid for it, you put it, probably was a headache, you know, to, to put it in. If you leave a very small gap, it's going to act like a MERV-8. So this is more to say that it's, it's important to take care of the filter bypass. My next topic is coil cleaning. Similar to filter bypass, I don't think we talk enough about coil cleaning, um, but they are important. They're important because all the air in our building go through coils, heat exchanger coils, can be heating coils, and in our case, it's more about cooling coils. And coils can impact your energy, can impact your indoor air quality, uh, and also can disseminate uh, pollutant back to the airstream. And I put here a study from the largest indoor air quality database ever done in the United States. They basically say, if you clean your coils twice per year versus one time per year, you actually will have a decrease in um, in, in respiratory uh, symptoms and, um, and also like productivity. So it's important to take care of your coils. And I, I did this piece, like the dirty secret of coils and filters. So this is part of the maintenance. So make sure that your coils are clean, are well placed and your coils are, are clean. And the objective when you choose coil cleaning, you need to make sure that you are deep, you are cleaning deep throughout the entire depth of the coils and you're not re-aerosolizing any particle that's stuck in the airstream. This is specifically important in COVID-19. And also, I know that there are a surge in cell in UV, UVGI. I put here a link for you uh, that explain what are the considerations when you are specking UV. And this is an example from an ASHRAE funded study. Um, I, I also put the link. On the top picture is a coil in Tampa, Florida. So when they came, they find the coil like this in the top picture. You can see clearly the coil is fouled. This is before application. And what they did, they basically got UV light, a very high intensity. They left it for a long time, 13 months, while changing it, while monitoring everything. The water temperature in the outlet, the air temperature, environmental conditions, and the fan power and, and speed and, and all of that. And after 13 months, and this is a very controlled study, they found the coil like you saw it in the bottom picture. So yes, you can argue that the coil improved, but the study concluded very clearly is that if your coil is fouled, don't put UV and expect that the fouling will go, will go away. If you're considering to put UV, you need to clean your coil mechanically. You need to make sure your, your coil is clean first. Uh, and this is a picture that uh, my team took. It's on the right-hand side. It's UV light installed in a, in a mechanical room, mechanical basically in, in an air handling unit after the cooling coil for seven months. And still you can see clearly stuff are still growing on, on the coil. So my, you might ask yourself, why, why is that? Why stuff are, are still growing on the coil? 
first thing is that, as I mentioned before, the virus does not exist naked. So the virus to be inactivated, you the, the light has to see the virus, has to shine on the virus. So if the virus is in, encapsulated in you know, a bodily fluid or different particulate matter or spores, simply the light is not gonna see the virus. The second one is dose and duration. And I've seen a lot of abuse in how we sell UV. Long story short, if you, you don't know what you're paying for, if you don't know what is the dollar per, per risk reduction, you shouldn't spec or install or, or buy any equipment like that. It's extremely important to have the dollar per risk reduction. So actually for UV, and this is very different than electronic air cleaners, for UV, we have an ASHRAE standard and ASHRAE guideline. We know UV in principle work, but you need to make sure that the intensity, so the dose and duration are correct for your application. Like if you put the UV behind the cooling coil where it's cold, the lamp intensity output can be lost 55%. So it's very important, okay, you're putting it before the filter, before the coil or after the coil, or basically in room, how much duration of exposure. You need to get this from the manufacturer, have an engineer to take a look at it and spec it correctly. Depreciation, I think it's very well understood, you know, because the light intensity will, uh, will basically diminish with time. Surface loss, so it's not a plug and play. If you are retrofitting today your air handling unit with UV light, it's not plug and play because you have to shield any organic material. Like for example, if you put it before the coil, after the filters, they're gonna ruin your filters, uh, etc. And then the last one is safety. Make sure, you know, cause it's gonna be a maintenance nightmare, uh, safety for the skin and, and for the eyes. Now about other strategies, um, electronic air cleaners, are basically referred to technologies uh, that use uh, basically any type of ions, plasma, reactive oxygen species, um, uh, ozone. They have a lot of hydro, hyd uh, like any, any radicals basically. They come up with these fancy names. They all mean the same thing. They apply a high energy to the air. And basically they contribute to more outdoor, air, sorry, to more indoor air pollution. So there are two problems with them. And if you, I put here the ASHRAE one, Website. What Ashri said basically is none of these technology are proven. Very important is that we don't have an Ashri standard today because many of these technologies did not, you know, approve or agree to bring their prototypes so Ashri can test it and give it to a university basically to do the research. So this is extremely important, and you can get this from the Ashri website. They're not proven, and also the Center of Disease Control say they they, they call them emerging technologies. We don't know if they work. We don't know if they're harmful. And they talk specifically about uh, needle point bipolar ionization, but also about you know, plasma, uh, about, um, there is a lot, so I cannot mention all of them. But basically, please check this link. And I have an example in the, in the next slide for you. Energy recovery ventilation, it says it depends. You have to do your homework to make sure if it's leaking back contaminants back to the airstream. There is a very, you know, a large guidance in the building readiness on ASHRAE website how to do that. Demand control ventilation, no, because here the idea is that you don't want to uh, change your outside air on demand. You want to say, okay, how many people are returning to my building? As the Dr. Shada mentioned before me, you calculate what is the minimum outside air for the number of people that are returning, and, and you set it, set it constant. You don't need to vary it. The last here is flush out. So flush out refers to basically how much outside air and how much time. Flush out doesn't mean 100% outside air and doesn't mean you have to open your building two hours before and two hours later. You can do a performance-based flush out. For ease of use, I, I did, did this graph and feel free to use it. On the y-axis, there is how much time I need to do flush out. How much time I should basically clean the air between, between like um, events or between uh, services or when people go home. And on the x-axis, basically, there is the air exchange rate. And it can be outdoors. I know I have outdoors, but also can be through your filters or can be through, through you know, air cleaning. And if you follow the orange line, Ashley say, reduce your indoor concentration by 95%. So for example, if you have outdoor air exchange rate of two, you only, and you go up and you look, look at the orange, you only need 1.5 hours of flush out. So if your occupants are coming at eight, you can just start your building at, at six and a half. And you can have your minimum outside air and your air is going through your filters and, and that should be enough. Um, 
This is a link to a paper that was recirculated recently. I'm not going to go through the detail, but I, wanna, I wanted to show you is that basically there is a lot of abuse happening in uh, the way that we talk about air cleaning in general. Um, so we have the basic filters that we know they work. They range different efficiency and also we have HEPA filtration. And as I told you before, they are very efficient and you can get the test and, and basically take a look at it. Now, the other part is electronic air cleaners, and I'm involved in 62.1. I have, you know, a lot of involvement with electronic air cleaners. And this is basically Dr. Offerman. He is a member of 62.1. He has 30 years of experience. He's an industrial hygienist. And he wrote this detailed paper about the fake marketing of electronic air cleaner. So please take a look at it if you are looking to buy any type of electronic air cleaners, any type of ion ion reactive oxygen species, plasma, take a look at this, at this paper. I put here the link. And basically what it says, like, like let's, let's assume they are safe. We don't know they are safe because we don't have one test that talk about practical life, you know, like in, in actually installed in, in system. We actually have a lot of paper that say they're not safe in terms of ozone, particulate matter, ultrafine, uh, and in terms of formaldehyde. And there are a lot of manufacturers, they publish it's safe, but you come to the published papers, scientific paper that actually tested in real life, they show, okay, the manufacturer says zero ozone, but when it's actually installed, they have high level of ozone. So if you, if you put the safety aside, there is also a lot of debate about efficiency. So I've seen a lot personally that say, oh, we're 99.9 .9 efficient to remove the coronavirus. And they basically have a Petri dish, they, sh they shine the equipment on it in a small chamber and they say 99.9% .9 efficient. But if you install the same equipment in an HVAC system, it can have efficiency, this type, 0.00116. So practically it's ineffective, it, it doesn't do anything. And I start seeing a lot of the lawsuits about different type of these electronic air cleaners. So I cannot stress enough, do your due diligence and ask the questions is that, how is the efficiency translated when I put it in my HVAC system, in, in, in my duct? And give me the safety data and actually installed in the HVAC system via a third party test. So far I have not found none and I would be happy to help you with uh, equipment. Now the other topic I have is the trade off between the different strategies. So here the question is that we have a lot of strategies. How can we choose and how can we know that we did enough? And again, I'm, fi I'm focusing on the basics and I wanna show you how the basics are, are sufficient. So again, with the effective air exchange rate, we have filtration, outside air and in-room air cleaning. On the Y axis, I have effective air exchange rate. On the X axis, I have different strategies and the colors show you in red, is uh, particulate filtration. In blue is outside air ventilation. And in yellow is basically from an air cleaner that have a fan and a, and a filter specifically. So if you don't have any outside air and you have MERV 13, you can see here uh, basically this column in red, you will have air exchange rate of six. By the classification of Harvard and UC Boulder, that's ideal. So imagine this, you don't need to do anything else. You, if, even if you don't have any outside air, if you have very good filter and you know the performance of it, you have an air exchange rate of six. You can always do more. Like if you have, for example, uh, the minimum outside air, the last one, per 62.1, a MERV 13 and a, an air cleaner, then you can have a very high air exchange rate. So this is a way for you to take, like specify a target and say, okay, what basic technologies I have, what is the air exchange rate? And if you wanna go one step more, there are actually a lot of tools that you can go and find today that do risk assessment. Most of these tools are for free. And some of them like the Heminez tool is also an Excel. You can download it and you can basically make it work for your type of project. They have pre-built stuff in it, like for a classroom, university, stadium. And basically most of them, they talk about probability of infection. And you can actually use the probability in your, in your city, like how many people are infected in your, in your city. So you can take a look at it this way. Or you can calculate air exchange rate. Now, when I looked at this personally, and I looked at all of that, there was something missing. So great, we know air exchange rate, and we know all the, all the risk, probability of infection. We know, for example, how much time we can spend in the gym, what is the safe exposure time, what is a space uh, safe dose? 
that's great. But what is something missing? The something the missing is what is the energy cost? So I teamed up with my colleagues and we have an energy estimator. We call it the COVID-19 energy estimator. It's also available for free. Uh, the official release will be on Tuesday, but feel free to communicate with me. I will put my email on the bottom of this uh, slide. Feel free to communicate with me and I will be happy to send you uh, a copy or to Rami and Rami can distribute. But basically, what's nice thing about it, you can use the other tools to calculate the air exchange rate or to calculate the risk. You can, you, 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 you it's optional. And, and or you can use this energy estimator. So this is standalone energy estimator to tell you what is the first cost for first cost operating cost for, for ventilation of, with outside air for different filters. It has pre-built efficiency. So you can choose any filter you need. Um, it has pre-built in it. What is the pressure drop? How much is going to cost? And also any type of air cleaner you want, it's also here. I had a lot of these rows because you know I, I know I needed to fit them on, on one slide. Also, you can choose what uh, strategy, what type of building, etc. So let me show you an example. Here I have an office building in Boston, 50,000 square feet, 250 people. Um, they have the minimum outside air per ASHRAE standard 62.1, and they have a filter that's much 72 inches. And remember what I told you about the filter that you can get them? Uh, this is an example of efficiency and pressure drop. So pressure drop versus, uh, versus airflow for different depths. If you go and plug in the filter, it's going to give you all this output. So you can plug for a certain output. And also, the calculator has an ability to compare many different scenarios. So here I compare, what if I have 100% outside air? What if I have prescriptive plus 30%? What if I have prescriptive VRP or IQP? And what's the different, basically, efficiencies? And also, you can add the air cleaning. I hear I have zero because I didn't assume I have an air cleaning. More than this, there's an ability to display nicely uh, the data for your clients. And this is something I always get. How can we show our client that we did enough or the parents? So there is here basically uh, the annual outside air plus filtration cost, including the maintenance. And the bubble size basically, I apologize if there is a problem with the formatting, but basically the bubble size is, is the cost. The way you read this is 100% outside air, you can achieve six air exchange rate, you pay this much, and this specifically in Boston. You can definitely do it for Jordan. Um, but you can actually achieve an excellent air exchange rate, five to six, but way less costly than basically 85,000. It's only cost you this much. Again, the specific for the rates and, and the climate in Boston. There's also a way to calculate cost per effective air exchange rate. So this is a metric I was talking about at the beginning, dollar per risk reduction or the dollar per air exchange rate. Um, also, we had an interest to look at the carbon impact. Um, and uh, I don't know if you have these efforts. I'm sure there is metric for sustainability. But also, you can take a look at the metric tons of CO2 per year for different strategies. And here we do the equivalent of how many uh, passenger vehicle. So for example, if all the buildings, for example, in Amman, they want to go 100% outside air, you can actually do it on a, on a national scale and say, okay, how much we're contributing to more pollution? To give you this as an example. So here I calculated for all the US offices, the small, medium, and large, if all of them decided to choose a different strategy, what will be the impact on, on the climate? For example, if all of them, they have 100% outside air, it's equivalent to adding 28 coal power plants per year. Imagine. And it's equivalent to add 23 million cars, passenger car. So, and whole, the whole spiel here is that we don't have to compromise on our budget. We don't have to compromise our, our carbon impact. We can do this using the basic strategies of outside air or only particulate filtration and a fan and a filter or add portable air cleaning in, in, in room and achieve a very good air exchange rate at affordable cost. And I put here toward the end of my slides, uh, basically a decision tree. And this is start. And, in, and you can use that in preparing your pandemic plan. For example, the first thing is that, do I have an HVAC system? You know, we might be dealing with buildings, they don't have even an HVAC system. Do I have ventilation? Do I have filtration? And if no, and if no or yes, calculate your air exchange rate. If it's not per your target, then add air cleaning. 
again, fan and a filter. And if you don't have any ventilation filtration, then install air cleaning to achieve your, your, your target. Then you can do the optimization I talked about. You can estimate your risk or air exchange rate. You can estimate your energy consumption, first cost, operating cost, maintenance. Then you can do your flush out plan, implement, maintain, and, and document. Now, before I end, there is uh, COVID-19 testing. There's a gentleman in the uh, previous presentation, he asked, how can we monitor air quality? So before the pandemic, basically we had uh, like basically a new trend in, in sensors. Typically we have temperature, temperature relative humidity and in many class A office buildings, we have CO2 sensor, carbon dioxide sensors. Carbon dioxide is great to tell you the sufficiency of ventilation, but it doesn't work well if you have filters, like filters and carbon dioxide, they don't, they don't, like they don't match. If you have filters, carbon dioxide low and high is not gonna tell you much about it. But what I wanna tell you here is that you can do COVID-19 testing, actual testing. And our clients use it in many different ways. Some emergency response plan. Some, for example, if you have break, uh, a break, um, uh, if, you, if you have a break in COVID-19 cases and you send people to quarantine, how you know they are safe to come back, you can do this testing. The first one is a swab test. You can swab any surface. The second one is air sampling test. So you can go around in the actual room and the air sampling test can tell you if all your strategies are working, ventilation, filtration, the masks, the social distancing. Um, both of those can tell you if the virus is absent or present um, and what is the concentration. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you if it's infective or not. So just like the key takeaways, um, we need to focus on the basics. The basics that worked before COVID, during COVID, and will work after COVID. Please do not invest and waste money on fancy technologies. Just a basic of a, of a good filter and a fan can do wonders. A little bit of outside air, if you can open windows, and if you don't have a problem with air pollution, can help you a lot. Maintain your systems, and anything you need to do extra, make sure you do it performance-based. Make sure you look at the data. The data is available. If you don't understand what you're paying for in terms of risk reduction, do not waste your time or, or your money. Um, these are my social media handles. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. I you know, do frequently uh, post about what I see in the field from, from our clients. And this is my email address in case you would like to have a copy of the energy estimator or a copy of this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marwa. Thank you so much. I think it was really a good brainstorm. Okay, uh, let's open the door for, for questions. Do anybody have a, have a, has a question? We have here a, some questions, Marwa. Uh, Mohammed, you can see, you can read the question from the Q&A if you just click on the bottom. Mohammed, he's asking the filters. You already uh, answered that question, I think. He's, it's the question from the last uh, session. Uh, yes, so this is a very good question. And basically, um, if I give you from the top of my head, a MERV 13 efficiency is 87%. If you cannot find a MERV 13 today, I'm aware of the shortage, you can have a MERV 11 that we call high performance MERV 11. So high performance MERV 11, as you see here in, in red, you can have a high performance MERV 11 that will help you, you know, in a great deal. And then you can supplement additionally with, with some outside air or with portable air cleaning. Okay. Mr. Saeed, is thank, uh, he sent thanks to you, Ms. Uh, Marwa, about the presentation. Same thing, Richie Mital. Richie, how are you? Richie is asking you, Marwa, where, where he can get the... Uh, where, he, where he can find the instrument to check the COVID partial. I think he was asking about the air sampler. Yeah, so basically, so I, I looked in the, I looked in Australia, so in the US and Australia and also in the Emirates, I know the labs basically where you can um, ask them for this swab test and then send it to the lab. I don't know in, in, in your region where it is exactly. But I know there is a lot of international lab, the labs that ramp up to do this, to do this testing. Uh, to do basically it's a, it's a PCR test, but not for human, it's for objects. Now this equipment, I basically personally bought from Germany. If you correspond with me, I can tell you. 
uh, there is I don't work for this company, uh, you know, they don't pay me, it's, I'm not on commission, and maybe there is a lot different, but basically what this instrument is, is a pump, and you have a filter, but then still you have to find a lab where you can send the filter, you can have the, the answer in like one to two days, but you have to look for a local lab, I'm not familiar with, uh, in Jordan specifically, where the, where the local labs are. Okay, anybody want to ask a question? There is Iba, Iba raised her hand. Iba, can you ask the question? If you have a question, can you please go ahead with your question? Uh, hello, good evening, Dr. Marwa. Marhaba. Marhaba, uh, Marhaba uh, Mohandes. Uh, um, actually, I don't have a specific question, but I couldn't stop myself uh, from uh, just thanking you because uh, you are like so smoothly giving us a lot of information, a lot of um, data and making it easy for us to understand how can we uh, live with this pandemic. We as researchers, uh, as architects, engineers, uh, how can we like um, um, put this new thing, like the COVID-19 pandemic in our designs, in our, th in our th uh, thinking. Uh, especially I am now uh, doing a research about how can we um, build or live in building a new uh, buildings with um, specific uh, let me say solutions for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. If I may say, how can we um, do a new environment um, in order to prevent us from getting this COVID? So I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Marwa. Um, I really loved your uh, presentation and uh, I hope we can get uh, to know each other in person maybe after the COVID. Thank you very much. Sure, no problem. It's my pleasure. And if I tell you here like a, like a personal story, my mom is a teacher from south of Lebanon. Uh, I don't know if I should talk it in Arabic or in English, I'm not sure. But basically, my mom is learning in Lebanon, and they can open the school. But they were afraid of the coronavirus, you know, and my mom has a special situation, she's a high risk. But they were able to open the school for the Syrian kids and Lebanese kids. And the problem in Lebanon is that we don't have the concept of indoor air quality in general in the Arab world. So the silver lining to this pandemic is to bring this indoor air quality awareness. You know, it's very important. I heard that, okay, we have a station for outdoor air quality. We can have the time to focus on the indoor air quality. And I know Rami is doing a lot of great work in the conference in general, in the community. بس المشكلة مثلا بجنوب لبنان ما عندنا concept اسمه ventilation ما عندنا concept اسمه filters like to start with سيما زير مروة عندنا الكهرباء بس 12 ساعة من أصل 24 ساعة ففي كتير challenges وأنا يعني رسالتي إنه we can do this we are all in this together and we can do it using basic technologies basic technologies منأكد إنه ترجع تشتغل حتى بعد كوفيد وهذا بيكون the first path نحنا بعالمنا كيف نفتح المجال ل good indoor air quality, good indoor air quality or acceptable or excellent indoor air quality. Okay, Marwa, we have some more questions here. Uh, what do you think of air purifiers using the following technologies? HEPA filters, uh, in uh, HEPA filters plus plasma technology plus heating up up to 56 degrees C. Will that be efficient to kill the COVID-19? Yeah. I have to be, you know, quite honest. Uh, I, I don't have a filter, you know? So, but I have to be quite honest. I'm, uh, my opinion, do not use anything that have electronic air cleaner. It's my personal opinion. I've been studying for this for a long time as a voting member of Ashley Standard 62.1 and looking at the test data. I actually vet these technologies like 10 to 12 of them each week. I did not obtain any time uh, a test that tell me it's safe and it's efficient, specifically how it's installed in buildings. And I ask you the question, what benefit does it make if you add something on top of a very good filter? HEPA filters remove 99.9% .9 efficient of, of the virus. If you have a very good fan and, and you install the filter, it can be ceiling mounted or in room, you don't need to do anything else. 
In fact, if I have an air cleaner in my house that have extra, I just disable the extra and I keep the fan and the filter. So this is my personal opinion. And I can tell you that you have to do your homework. You have to ask the right questions because there are a lot of misleading marketing out there. Okay, another question from Khalid. He's, still, he's asking how many times do we need to do air samplers or swabs to, for hospitals? Yeah, I, this is like completely optional. So there is no like a set uh, time. There's a lot of talk now about the rapid tests for people and also for uh, like equipment. This is something that you have to decide in, in your plan. And also most importantly, you have to decide if you have like, if you have a positive test, what you should do with it. So I don't have the answer for you. It really depends of what you're trying to achieve. Our emergency response plan, we're doing random testing weekly in dorms room, for example, in dorms room in, in a university in Florida. We do the test randomly every week. We take the test two days to come back. And based on that, we decide what we need to do. The nice thing about the test, it also gives you concentration. So if you're implementing a new strategy, for example, you might need to test frequently at the beginning to make sure your strategy is working and you're protecting, for example, the nurses and, and, and the doctors. Okay, I think last questions or comments about having the presentation. We will make sure that everybody gets a copy from the presentation soon. And uh, we have Zaid. Zaid Nahas, I'm sorry, you have you raised your hand in the previous uh, from the previous session. Do you want to ask any question or comment to Dr. Marwa? Mr. Zaid, do you have any question? Okay, Marwa, seems not. Okay, I just want to say that also you will receive a link. This is a link that you can download uh, the, um, uh, the energy estimator if you're interested in doing energy analysis, energy and risk analysis. This yeah, guy. that would be great. Actually, for everyone, what we conclude from also Dr. Marwa's presentation that you need always to use an expert to decide what exact uh, system of filtration you need. You cannot really judge from anybody that comes to you uh, okay, I have this uh, kind of UV, uh, ionizers, blah, blah, blah. You can, he, cannot, he cannot have the full answer for you. You have to, uh, let's say, ask the experts, uh, do your exercise, do your homework. Not everything can work in your case. Everything is case by case. Depends on large number of contaminants, this number of contaminants. So this depends on so many inputs. And we, we have seen the paper or the document that Marwa will share with us, the energy estimator, you have a lot of input to data that you need to plug in. It's not a matter that you say, here is the size, here is the people, here's the answer. It, need, it needs really an, an opinion of, of a real expert like Dr. Marwa or anybody who's expert in the air quality or something like that. You need to consult him and it's not really a shameful. It's very good exercise to ask always the expert because we are seeing now the whole world is still in kind of the filters in the world. Everybody talks about UV, everybody talks about cleaners, electronic cleaners, everybody talks about filtration. Correct or not, Marwa? Yes. And that's, that's a big problem, by the way. Yeah, you need to make informed decision. And I always say, if you cannot explain it yourself, do not buy it. If you don't know what your risk you're reducing, do not buy it. And most importantly, you know, you need like third party data. If the manufacturers say 99.9% .9 efficient, it's not need enough. Yes. Need a test inside the, that mimic inside the condition. I can make any test to look 99%. Give me any equipment, I will get you 99% result. That doesn't mean that this 99% result would be the same when you installed in the HVAC system. There's the airflow speed, there's the residence time, there's the exposure. So, you know, if you take anything from my presentation today is you need to do your homework, especially if you have a limited budget, especially if you're dealing with like, you know, high risk like schools, for example, you know, schools or elderly or something like that. So do your homework. Okay, Marwa, we got a last question actually from Mr. Ahmed. He said, how we can separate each room protected in hospital alone from other room from bacteria or viruses? I mean, this is the question like we, how can we prevent the infection control? Is that the same question? Yeah, and, and you know, luckily Ashley has done a very good job in the healthcare to do a lot of you know, guidance about how to create uh, an isolation room. And this is actually the same when we talk about if you are in your home and like your spouse or your kid or yourself 
how to do a quarantine in home, how to do it in a school for the nurse office or how to do it in hospital. So I don't want to do it like a short answer, but basically you need to make sure like you have the concept of negative, a negative pressure room. So as much as you can, negative pressure room and you have a specific bathroom. And if you, you were to put an air cleaner, you put the air cleaner with the person who's infected. I know this sounds counterintuitive. I have actually a paper coming in Ashrin in December that talk about how can we create isolation in, in homes. It's very important to put it in the person that is infected, not to protect him because he's already infected, but to decrease the disease generation. It's better to put it where the person is infected and create isolation. Isolation can be created in many different ways. Like in home, you can use a bathroom fan or you can put a, you know, a window fan, for example. Um, in hospitals, you have a more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated system, basically. 